Good morning, guten Morgen, and welcome again. Moin Moin from Northern Germany. My name is David Patrician, and once again, it's my great honor and pleasure to be your host for day three of the Open Science Conference today. Uh, yeah, before we get started, a few quick things. Uh, first of all, Professor Klaus Tuchterman and the entire ZBW team, they wanted to extend their, their welcome for the third day. And also to let you know this afternoon, we have a fantastic panel discussion uh, dealing with open science in a time of global crisis. And that panel discussion will be moderated by Klaus Tuchterman, the director of ZBW. So that's really something to look forward to this afternoon. Also, before I begin, um, we were talking about it in our warm-up this morning. And again, always a big thank you to our two technicians, Zachary and to Ricardo, for making everything look and sound so good. And uh, we wanted to say a big congratulations. In case you are watching it here in Germany, it was in the evening around the world, probably different times, where we had on Mars the rover Perseverance land and absolutely um, Gänsehaut, we say in German, I'm forgetting my English here, goosebumps, really something really fantastic to watch. And congratulations to all the astronaut scientists. The mission was led by NASA, but also many other countries, including the European Space Agency, played also a really important role in this. And uh, yeah, it really is a great example of how teamwork, scientists, people coming together and working for a positive thing and I highlight that because we need good news, especially in 2021. So congratulations to everyone and looking forward to seeing what kind of information and what, what we all learn about Mars and how that information will be spread around, of course, probably with open data as playing a part of a big role of that. Okay, and as promised, I always like to start off with a little bit of fun. We had two quiz questions yesterday. So uh, with the motto of learning something new every day, I wanted to say, what is the only metal that is a liquid at room temperature? And the answer there was mercury. And the second question is, what is the first element on the periodic table? And that was hydrogen. I actually had to go back and look that up. As a kid, we always used to study that, the uh, periodic table. So hope you enjoyed a little bit of fun with that quiz question. Yeah, and uh, I also had a remor uh, one more organizational thing dealing with appointments. I wanted to remind everyone you can schedule appointments, for example, with the speakers that you could not meet in the Meet the Speaker sessions or with poster presenters. And you can schedule meetings with up to six people. So you still have the chance to do that. Just go to the attendee hub and you can go ahead and make appointments because we want to try to be as interactive as possible. Okay, I've got that out. Take a deep breath here. As you can tell, I'm a little bit excited. It is day three and we just landed on Mars, so I'm very excited. But we are now ready to get to begin with day three of the Open Science Conference. And once again, it is a great honor. We have two distinguished guests with us this morning. We'll be hearing from Marta Sibyl Kessler, as well as from Leonard Voltz. And I wanted to begin by giving a brief introduction uh, about Marta. Marta is with the Stiftverband Germany. And the Stiftverband in English, I guess we would call it the Donors Association. And they primarily act as a thought leader and provide financial support to actors in academia that develop bottom-up solutions. The In OSCE Future Lab program works with multidisciplinary teams and utilizes innovation methods to develop solutions for the most pressing challenges in education, science, as well as innovation. Marta's talk today is titled Generation O, Scaling Open Practices in Higher Education. How can we help open pioneers, innovators, and activists change the higher education system? Among other things, she will reflect on ways of how open practices can be strengthened to become a powerful tool to make research and science more accessible in all ar arenas and in society. It has really been a common theme these past few days, transparency and accessibility. And I hope we have good access now to Marta. Marta, hello, can you hear and see me okay? Hello, yes, good morning. Good morning. Uh, can you tell us where you are? I believe it's somewhere in Germany. Yes, I'm in Berlin, actually. Ah, the capital, the Hauptstadt, wonderful. And right. I know there are many, many things to do and see in Berlin. Maybe one personal highlight for you before we begin with your talk. Yes, absolutely. So um, what I love about Berlin, I guess, is that it's an international city and a big city and you get the energy you would expect from it, but it's also a very green city. And my personal highlight is Tempelhofer Feld, which is the old airport. And it's just a huge 
a green area and everyone is having a lot of fun there and enjoying life and this is very delightful. It is beautiful. It's almost like a central park of Berlin and with a lot of history surrounding it. Okay, thank you very much for sharing that. So without further delay, it is my great pleasure to introduce Marta and her talk, Generation O, Scaling Open Practices in Higher Education. Marta, the digital stage is yours. Yes, thank you so much, David, for the introduction. And obviously a big shout out also for the team that organized the conference. Um, very much appreciated and thank you so much. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you today about possibilities, how we could um, scale open practices in higher education by supporting Generation O, meaning um, openness, pioneers, innovators, and activists. Um, so we, we are InnoSci and we are an initiative by Stifterverband, a German organization, like David said, and we are supported and funded by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And we are also part of the High Tech Strategy 2025 by the German government. And um, our approach is that we want to link open science and open innovation, bring them together in order to really um, unleash or uncover the potential of um, an open innovation culture. And with COVID-19, um, we have seen that this is more important than ever, because obviously we need science and research to um, increase our knowledge on um, the virus, but also we need to really work and um, yeah, work together across the disciplines, across the sectors, for example, to find a cure, to um, produce a vaccine. And we also have to um, work together in order to inform political decision making and also to get buy in by the people. Um, we, well, our approach is or we really support openness by design, meaning um, we have to think about openness starting with the skill set, starting with the individuals, but also to think about open methodologies we can use for uh, research and also um, thinking about how can we design successful organizations and obviously how can we um, shape our political systems and framework so that we are really supported and funded in a good way to support open research and innovation. Um, because we leave, believe only with openness and um, a very strategic approach on that, we can manage um, systemic innovation requirements like we see with COVID-19 right now. We can link existing knowledge um, more effectively. We can improve trust in research. We heard that um, quite a couple of times. And obviously, we can also increase relevance and impact of science and innovation to make it really work for us as a society and to make a, make a difference here on that side. So Generation O, how can we support them in a good way? Um, we believe that it's the individual that makes a difference. So if we want to um, see a shift in open science, we have to um, look at the individual who is the driver. So here on my picture, you see Margaret Hamilton, a fine individual. She worked as a um, data scientist and um, she invented the computer code that helped us to land on the moon. Um, and by the way, or by chance, she also uh, was responsible to invent the software system itself. So we wouldn't um, sit here today and have a digital conference if it wouldn't be for her. And probably we couldn't do open science. We are doing it um, right now if um, there wouldn't be her as a, a strong individual and a, yeah, openness innovator or an innovator herself. And it's the same with COVID-19 here in Germany. Right now, we are pretty proud that the two founders of BioNTech grew up in Germany and there's quite a bit of storytelling going around how they really believed in their mission and how this moved the needles to make a difference. Um, so what can, can we do to support um, individuals? So based on this key assumption, um, we as InnoSci and Stifterverband, we developed an um, innovation lab called InnoSci Future Lab um, program, where we invited 12 openness innovators and practitioners to work with us in a curated um, design thinking process. So we came together for two um, sprints where we really try to explore 
the um, ecosystem and the field of um, open science and open practices in higher education to understand the issues individuals are facing, to um, understand why, um, why can't we scale open science, open practice in an easy way like we would like to see it. And we conducted um, interviews and then um, we worked on a set on possible solutions um, to give advice and some help how to really um, scale or support Generation O. So um, here I brought you our design team um, who worked on the process. And you can see that we have a broad and wide um, set of backgrounds, but each of um, them are working on supporting openness in their specific fields. Is it open innovation or open access or um, how can we in increase impact? And with the help of the design team, we were able to create a 360 degree perspective to really understand the problem and then to think about good solutions. So what are the potential needs and fields of actions if we think about open, openness innovators and pioneers? Um, so we regard open science as a wicked problem. Wicked problems are hard problems, because if they would be easy, I guess um, we would um, practice um, open science everywhere already. And um, so wicked block problems are defined um, through a couple of things. So um, it's very hard for them to, um, well, they are complex, first of all. They, um, <clears throat> they are multi, they are multi layers. There aren't um, clear responsibilities if you want to solve them. And obviously you need um, to really change behavior and there are unforeseen um, results and consequences if you want to move them. And if you regard that, or if we utilize this as a lens, the wicked lens, the um, wicked problem to look at open science, it becomes very clear um, what the challenges are and why there are a couple of hurdles we have to over, um, overcome. So um, when we did our analysis and tried to understand um, higher education and the challenges for open science, it became obvious that there are many players and stakeholders involved. And um, there are many interdependencies. And um, we have identified three main groups. And that's very high level, obviously. But um, we see open um, policy makers who really um, shape the system and um, create the framework where we are working in. Then we have enablers. These are people who work in supporting uh, roles, in particular at universities. So that could be people, for example, working for an open access office. And then we have the innovators who really practice, open practice, and um, yeah, move the needle here on the impact by doing so. So I brought you a couple of quotes because um, we believe that um, we have to understand the individuals to, um, to really understand the problem. So if you follow the design thinking process, you need to understand um, the problems to then think about the solutions. So um, it's important not to jump into solutions straight away, but first understand the perspective of the other person and get in their shoes. And so we have the openness innovators, and I will read out some quotes for you. So um, we hear people saying, if we put a focus on quality, research will be better off. I believe we all think that. It um, depends very much on individual people's. Open science topics are referred from A to B and no one feels responsible. Um, we didn't get the tools we needed um, from the university. There's no support and we cannot convince deniers with the openness argument. Rather, it makes sense to find suitable solutions to the problem, problem of skepticism. And then finally, we have given up hope that the German Research Foundation will impose top-down open science requirements. So if we look at the perspective of open enablers, so again, people who support open practice and innovators, uh, we heard them saying, open science became part of the university strategy. 
because there was funding for it. I would like us to do open science, not only for the sake of money. And then we heard, and we heard that a couple of times in other presentations over the last two days, younger researchers in particular are more open to open science, while their older colleagues are skeptical. They asked why they should publish their research data at all. Then we also heard um, we need new job profiles and technical know-how. Finally, um, Enabler said we must not simply provide infrastructure and resources, but create experimental spaces where things can be tried out, where people can work together. And then obviously we have the policymakers. And here it's important if we look at policymakers, these are people who um, are in um, decision makers in or at university, but also in administration and in politics. And so um, we heard them si saying, in open science, I have always signaled, do what you think is right. As university management, I did not take this on board. And then rectorates don't know what um, their open science experts are doing. Two parallel worlds exist there. Open science arrives at university leadership and it's delegated elsewhere. And then we heard from people working in the administration um, and in the ministry saying open science must be demanded by science so that politics can act as catalyst. We are only a few employees for open science in the ministry. Compli uh, it is complicated to, to reconcile all interests. So if we look at these um, personal individual quotes, it obviously it's um, easy to also um, make assumptions um, about the systemic challenges um, and also to think and develop some solutions. So in general, um, we um, can see on a systemic level, there's a lack of knowledge about open science among policymakers. There's a lack of strategic anchory, anchoring at the university management. Um, there's non-systemic identification and promotion and structures and hierarchy makes it very difficult for innovators to even get through with their concerns. And um, the innovators themselves, they have um, obviously their limits to their individual commitment and um, it's a very high time commitment that is even required to um, yeah, get new knowledge and skills. And um, open science, and obviously we heard that a lot as well, it's not rewarded by the scientific reputation system, which is a huge problem. Um, on the other hand, we have um, a lack of um, know-how, job profiles at university levels are not updated, and um, a funding policy is not aligned with open practices at all, which is difficult as well. So, sorry, I think my slide skipped. I will go through it very quickly. So what are possible solutions and opportunities um, we can recommend for policymakers to really um, dive into these issues? Um, so there um, are a couple that we can um, point out because um, so we see that um, we have to incorporate open practices into job profiles and staffing decisions if we want to make a difference. We want to um, professionalize open practices through structure, services, budget. And we also have to promote a culture of innovation in the administration and ministries themselves to make the difference and move the needle. And we um, have also to build a better open standard of open practices and the knowledge and skills across all sector, not only in higher education, but also um, in school and also in, um, in um, the economic sector when we want to um, think across all sectors. And then obviously we have to think about better ways to appreciate open innovators and to um, consider their concerns and then utilize them as experts to co-design policies and align funding policies as well with their their um, specific needs. 
Um, so there are a couple of starting points that we identified with our project. Um, so very hands-on solutions for people who work in um, higher education and who are in a position to, um, to make a difference and support Generation O. So um, we can um, open up spaces and promote exchange between open practitioners. We um, have to recognize and support innovators and we also have to expand their knowledge and skill set and um, enabling learning and experimentation in higher education in general. And then obviously we have to um, create strategies and um, shape organization um, on a broader level. So um, the design team in Future Lab, they um, came up with three prototypes. Um, that can be utilized at higher education to um, promote Generation um, O. And one is a self-assessment tool and maturity model for open practices that helps um, decision makers and leadership at university to really understand do, where do we stand with open practices at our organization and what could be tools and um, things we could do to move the needle. And um, we will pilot um, this prototype um, this year and also work with universities to really make it bulletproof and then scale it also to an international uh, level to utilize it to better understand um, what is the ecosystem and um, how do we have to assess that. Then um, we, um, the design team um, designed an incubator for a strengthening open science and also scaling problem solving competencies. And there um, will be a toolbox where we can um, learn about what um, can we do in higher education to really invite people or have um, people from all sectors uh, who come to the university and have a program in residence where um, we can learn from each other. And the third um, prototype that was developed um, by the team is an elective learning module, um, which is a certificated online course where, um, again, people from all sectors come together and co-design the content to really combine research and practice. So um, these are some concepts that um, we will scale, but then obviously the question is, so what could, um, leadership or policy makers do straight away in a very easy manner to uh, make a difference in higher education. And um, so we captured here a couple of ideas and recommendation. And um, the first one is to include open science activities and capabilities in grant and appointment criteria, and also use it as a tool for career development at universities. And then obviously it's important to provide human and technical support structures and then promote the acquisition of knowledge on the part of researchers and science managers. Then one opportunity is to really gain access to external or internal knowledge carriers through interdisciplinary teams, job rotation, fellowships. Um, it's an opportunity to strengthen meta science at um, your university and then very important to strengthen creativity and innovation through working methods. So you could, for example, like design thinking that we use to um, come to our solution. You could in, um, introduce that to your working culture or agile working methodologies, etc. And then um, it would be um, an easy way to move the needle to create local or digital meeting spaces via event that could be conferences like we are on right now or hackathons, but also very low key lunch breaks where um, creators come together and you learn from their needs and they learn from each other. And then obviously you can increase visibility and appreciation if you introduce um, rewards, etc. So um, I come to the end. Um, so what's now? Actually, the future is now and we are all in, um, to, in to it together because um, he, everyone who is on the conference today obviously is Generation O and we can support each other. And so there are so many great projects and initiatives going on. And if we keep pushing, then we also can change the system as an individual, but also on a systemic level. And I'm really looking forward 
to doing that together with you. Um, and yes, um, we, I would like to invite you to join our online community and I'm calling all creators to um, yeah, really join forces and um, let's move the needle together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marta. I have to say the presentation was excellent and we already have many, many questions. So I'm just going to cut the small talk and go straight to the questions. We have a few minutes to answer a few of them. Um, let me start off with the first question. Do you know of any st statistics studies that show that young researchers are more open to OS? And how does this openness show concretely? Mm -hmm. Right. So they are actually, it's more a gut feeling. And I think ob obviously we don't do um, researchers who are in the system for a very long time justice if we just say it's the young people. It's actually not, um, not quite correct. It's a broad spectrum of people who really support open science, open practice, openness, um, but it's sometimes easier or to see it more, uh, we see it more often with younger, younger um, people who really um, push for it and are very um, yeah, energized about it as well. Very good. Our next question, how much do open innovation practices have in common with open science practices? Yeah, so I mean, there are always huge discussion that we can't just, um, yeah, just pretend that open innovation and open science are the same, and they are not. But we really believe there are open practices like um, open data, for example, that um, we see along the, um, the research um, process and the innovation funnel that work for both concepts, where we could say, well, we have open data. Um, research and science are doing it and we can really utilize the data for increase our knowledge base and to impact society but it it's also goes the other way around so in, um, also companies um, can um, work open data and they have data that we could utilize to really um, build on research and to um, yeah, help society to um, get informed in a better way and so I think there are some areas that are we have to um, think about um, in separate um, boxes, but there are many approaches and practices that really work for open science and open innovation. And if we link that and we create a community where we can really collaborate across the disciplines, across the sectors, then we get this sweet point where we really can move the needle and we benefit as a society. Yeah, excellent. Our next question, how can we support OS practices in younger learners in grade school? Yeah, actually, I think this is probably um, the starting point. We already should think about um, creativity, innovation, open practices um, when we think about our school system. And um, I think it really, again, starts with Generation O. I mean, if we have teachers who really make sure that um, concepts where you collaborate are, um, are strengthened and supported at school, then we can already um, learn it there. But um, it's usually, I mean, we, we know it from our um, own school that sometimes it's more like these testing scenarios. You have to know things and you have to come up with um, the right answer yourself. But I think there's already um, a lot going on where um, kids in school already learn how to collaborate and um, yeah, I think it's definitely the system that we need to change and we have to uh, push for an open innovation culture and creativity and openness um, as something that is really valued. And um, yeah, we have a learning culture on that. Absolutely good. Correct in everyday life as well. I agree. Um, we have a great question from Carolina Doran. The question is how to convince senior members of my institute about open science. They have established carriers and are in a very comfortable position. What do they gain from it? In other words, can you give me an elevator pitch I can use to convince them? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we heard one of the quotes that I read out to you is that um, it's not, you can't really convince um, people who are deniers or skeptical about it. It's more you really need to think what do they want and what do they need? So what is it that um, yeah, the leadership team wants and needs? Is it maybe more 
um, visibility? Is it maybe create research partnerships? Is it um, new ideas? And I think when you find again the sweet spot, then it's easier to say, oh, well, I have a solution and openness or open science, open practices, open innovation could be the answer for exactly the problem you have. Because, um, yeah, we can tap into the collective brain power of people and the collective brain power you might have in your organization. And there might be already solutions um, that you can utilize for the new problem you, you just um, found and mentioned. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot of questions, but I'm going to try to go to two, two or three more real quick. Fantastic round here. Um, the next question is, do you have any examples of self-assessment tools for OS? Yeah, so actually this is what we want to develop right now. And this is uh, the tool I also presented. And um, as I said, it will be a, um, there will be a pilot phase and then it will be also um, provided to the community so that everyone can utilize um, the self-assessment tool to understand where do I stand with my open practices? Where does my organization stand? And hopefully at um, one point we also can see where it's where our different countries um, are right now with open practices, and then we can make a comparison and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Very good. Next question, related to the question on young researchers versus old researchers, isn't it also a question of research fields, some fields being more open than others? Yes, that's absolutely true. I think every field, um, there are opportunities to be open, but obviously there are some fields where there's much more pressure and sometimes it um, seems to be easier if you are data driven, for example, than if you work in the social science, but um, obviously that that's true. And again, it's uh, just a gut feeling of the person we interviewed saying that it's um, the younger people are doing much more. I think that shouldn't be a generalization at that point. I think we are all generational. Yeah. I totally agree with you on that. Uh, this next question, I, I contribute, to, uh, it's from Robbie Morrison. Let me start with that. I contribute to an open energy modeling community, open mod of some 400 plus members. Our biggest barrier is the EU database directive 96 slash nine slash EC, creating legally encumbered public data sets. Can you comment? I'm not familiar with that. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I can comment on that. The legal issues are usually a huge barrier. And often we see that if we really talk about cooperation, collaboration, research partnership, it's a huge undertaking to really clarify um, the legal questions before we even start working together. And obviously on the EU, EU basis, that's the case as well. And I think we, we still have to do a lot of work there. And I think there, it's again, something that where um, politics and administration has to um, find good solutions where we create safe spaces, but also um, utilize the opportunity. And it's a lot about trust as well. And we could also think about standard, um, standard formats that we could utilize to um, really yeah, move the needle again on that. But yeah, it's we hear that all the time and it's a huge problem and there are many individual questions and not one solution fits at all. Okay, super. Time for two more quick questions. I'd ask you also to keep, you've been fantastic, but keep the answers as short as possible. Is open and innovation a different way of defining what companies see as pre-competitive spaces? What is the role universities can play in creating such space, such places? Can can you repeat? So the question is that. Um, sure, I'll read it again. Is, the pre is, is open in innovation a different way of defining what companies see as pre-competitive spaces? What mm -hmm. is the role universities can play in creating such places? Yeah, I think actually. Um, it's all about um, creating space for experimentation. And I think university can really play a major role in providing these space, spaces there. I mean, already existing many innovation hubs, for example, at university where people come together and um, companies are invited. Or we have campus um, where um, yeah, companies provide spaces where maybe also university um, players come in. But um, I think it's always good if university 
or higher education goes in a leading role on that because that's um, obviously a little bit more neutral than um, when companies um, think about um, open innovation. But actually, again, I think there are areas where it's not only about um, competition, also with companies. Nowadays, it's really companies also have a social responsibility and they have a need to play a role in really shaping our future. And if we think about the new innovation fields like mobility, for example, or um, if we think about energy, etc., cetera, it, it becomes clear it can't be just a competitive um, thing that um, companies work on. It's something where we have to involve um, the society, we have to involve, involve um, university, we ha have to involve research, science. And again, I think um, we need to experiment more, play more in this um, field. And um, yes, I think universities are the, in the lead for that. Fantastic. Marta, the last question, and I think you'll enjoy this question. Would you say more about your online community? Is it international and how can we join? Yes. So right now it's actually German based, but we are very happy to, um, we want to be international. And I'm actually hoping that this um, maybe today is the starting point. And so you will find our community. So it's an um, yeah, online community. You will find it on our homepage. And yeah, shoot me an email if you have any question or join, and then we will invite you and you can participate. It's really about a community um, driven um, effort where we create, the community creates what's going on there. Super, thank you very much, Marta. Can I ask you a quick question? Uh, we have the Meet the Speakers happening here in German time, Central European time at 12.15. Will you be there for that as well? I will be there and I'm looking forward to more more questions and a broad discussion and many ideas also from you um, what we could do better and where we can yeah, make a difference. Fantastic. Then as is our tradition here, we want to give you a digital round of applause from around the world. Thank you very much. A great way to start off our day three, really a fantastic presentation. And yeah, I also just got the numbers in. We have almost 200 attendees this morning. So I think you've reached a really good audience. And uh, yeah, congratulations. Great job. If you can, stick around for our second talk for this morning.